you believe that any of the growing political unrest around the world, especially Tunisia and Egypt, is linked to higher food prices, which the questioner says results from the Fed's large-scale asset purchases? I'm not sure I accept the premise of the first half of the, of the question. Well, we reject Ben Bernanke's rejection of the premise, and here's why. It's not just Egypt. We're seeing it in Algeria, Tunisia, Jordan, Yemen. The list goes on. All countries with something very critical in common. The people are being strangled by soaring food costs now at their highest levels ever. Coupled with high unemployment, the cost of food has been the uniting force of revolt. For the lucky Arabs who actually have a job, it's estimated they spend up to 80% of their income on food. And guess who's behind the price spikes? Washington, Wall Street, and China. And while China is the hardest for us to control, we can deal with the two-headed beast that is Washington and Wall Street. The short-term problem is on Wall Street. You see, for decades now, food suppliers and farmers have been signing contracts designed to lock in their prices for a predetermined later date. It's essentially a way to hedge their bets against sudden fluctuation in costs and prices. Speculators have always been a key reason why this system works. They pump money into it. But you know the mantra, everything in moderation. Too much speculation distorts food prices. You've heard of the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble. Let's call this one the food bubble. The number of people going hungry is rising on the earth for the first time in history. Food prices predicted to jump another 20% this year. And as the bubble squeezes our world's poorest, it is releasing torrents of anger and frustration. People blaming their governments for the results of this rampant speculation. But the biggest blame does not lie on Wall Street. The most sinister driver of exploding global food prices is in the hallowed halls of our central government, hell-bent on covering up 2008's massive megabank theft. The Federal Reserve's answer to cover up that theft was to turn on the money printing machine in overdrive, creating trillions of new dollars on their computers, pumping them into our economy to cover up the bank's losses. The consequence, lowering the value of our currency. And as we continue to do that, investors and non-investors alike are watching commodity prices soar in correlation to that money printing. Corn, wheat, copper, oil, you name it. And it's not just in those other countries. So whether you're cursing food and gas prices at home this summer and wondering why, or you're a stunned observer of the unrest in the Middle East, Realize both are the direct result of a pay cut from money printing as your government remains hell-bent on propping up the megabanks. And to further help us connect the dots, I want to bring in Bill Fleckenstein, hedge fund manager, investor based in Seattle, somebody uh, expert on uh, all of these variables. Bill, and how closely does the money printing policies of our central bank correlate to the overall rise in commodity prices? I think it correlates uh, quite well, but not precisely. And it's the not precisely part, I think, that often confuses people because um, people will say, well, why should printing money necessarily cause food prices to go up? And that is the problem with printing money. When you create it, m money uh, out of thin air, you don't know where it will go. We saw it go into stocks in the stock bubble. We saw it go into real estate in the real estate bubble. And now it's going into uh, commodities and other things. But what it does is it turns the average person into a speculator. It's not just speculation in the, in the futures markets. There have been stories in all the papers about how farmers in China holding back their cotton crop to businessmen who make cotton shirts buying in advance. When people believe that the money will no longer be good, they put it into things. And when those things are food and you have crop disruptions, then you start to see what's happening and then you get the dominoes start to tip over like we're seeing now. Uh, and I want to talk about our own dominoes and the relationship between America's mega banks, the political contribution system where 40 percent uh, of the political donations for both Republicans and Democrats come from the bank. So you have the giant banks as the bulk provider of money for politicians. You have the implicit and explicit support of the central government, both through uh, tax code and money printing. You then get the 
what you just described, the new money going someplace, in this case into a food bubble, and then the food bubble has this impact on the poorest nations, whereas we just reported 80% of their income goes to food, which is inconceivable to Americans. Uh, just how sinister is that wheel between the banks, the political contributions, the support, uh, soaring prices, and the unrest? Well, it, it, it's, 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 it's extremely unfortunate, and, but it's how interests get aligned because the groups of people that you mentioned who... Um, actually might be benefit from all this money printing Wall Street banksters and all these other folks, they have lots of money and they do things with it and they get more money. It's the people that don't have any money that get pressured and unfortunately they don't have a heck of a lot of clout. So uh, money printing and the things that are done by our central bank and other central banks in the name of, of um, uh, suppressing prices that are too low, i.e. fighting deflation, have now seen their unintended consequences in screaming agricultural and commodity prices and related prices. Because when psychology starts to change, then people modify their behavior and it gets into the other sorts of prices. And it's all because we have a central bank that won't ever face, face its mistakes and always wants to print money to solve whatever the problem is. As more and more people in this country come to understand something that you've known and understood for years, something that many folks have been rapidly getting educated on since the financial crisis, what is the alternative or what are some of the alternatives that could be entertained today instead of the money printing strategy that we're getting from our government now? Well, um, I know this will probably make a lot of people laugh, but when we were on a gold standard, there's nothing magical about gold. It was just a rule uh, as to how much money you could create. And it had an elegant check and balance because if you were a country that was doing things that the world thought improper from a monetary standpoint, gold left your country and you had to then tighten. So I, I know it sounds like I want to go back to Stone Age times when I mentioned the gold standard, but we need rules whereby the money is fixed in value and other things fluctuate. We have tried to make it so the economy and, and other things don't fluctuate, and we let the, we, we've turned money into being worthless, and therefore we've had these these wild distortions in the economy and the financial markets. So we have to we have to go back to some sort of standard where we don't have a group of men in a, in a in a committee meeting deciding what the right interest rate should be and how much money to print to get that uh, so that we can um, uh, stop all this in insane misallocation of capital that, that, that continues. Yeah. Listen, uh, Bill, it is always a pleasure. We have all learned from you and continue to. Uh, thank you very much. Bill Fleckenstein uh, out of Seattle.